南京是一个美丽的城市，也是有历史的城市。了解过去可以，了解过去可以帮助我们呃更好的看到这个城市的呃未来。第一次我去啊、呃、中山陵，中山陵的时候，我看到孙孙中山的三民主主义，民主、民权、民生。When I first saw this representation of his dream for China, I thought I could understand. What his meaning was. For four thousand years, China was ruled by emperors from the top down. And what Sun Yat-sen was saying here was that in the future, China should be ruled from the bottom up. And this year, while we celebrate. The 100 year of the government, we realize that the government and the rulers of China have kept to this promise of winning the people's hearts, of winning the people's trust. I start with this presentation. That's exactly what is happening in technology today. From the first day of when technology was invented, when we had the huge mainframes, and if you remember COBOL programming and so on, it was technology ruling society from the top down. And over time, in this complex chart, we've seen how large businesses have organized themselves. Around modularization, around business integration, around platform independence, they even tried service-oriented architecture, which means that、uh, the institution gives you a service, and the institution is struggling to give you a service that responds to your business needs, but without having. A lot of technology around it. That world has changed today, because of open source, because of platforms like GitHub and Red Hat and other forms of open source platforms. The world today belongs to the end user. Today we talk about collaboration, we talk about personalization, and large companies like IBM. Are finding it very difficult to be profitable in today's world. That revolution of giving technology back to the people is going through a fundamental change today. It's going through an amazing change that is going to revolutionize society. Technology is not going to be owned by the large platforms. Technology is going to be owned by. You and me as end users. That revolution probably started with the invention of the internet, and then with the HTTP. In the early days of the platform technology, if you remember, it was dominated by players like Amazon, Baidu, and so on. In 2011, a very interesting revolution took place. All of that technology was transferred to the mobile device. Because of this very simple transformation, taking existing platform technology and putting it on mobile, we saw the rise of new forms of business models. Today, we cannot live without Weixin, without Alipay, without N Financial, and so on. And that revolution took place very recently, in 2011. And guess what? That revolution is again going to be changed, and it's going to go through another revolution called 
personalization. And that revolution has already started. In 2011, when, when mobile became the de facto device, all of the businesses that did very well in the platform era had to revolutionize very quickly. Yes, the mobile device, the smartphone, whether it's the iPhone or the Android, was created or invented in 2007. But it took about three to four years before they became commonplace enough for the revolution to start. So in the same way, today, because of a revolution taking place in blockchain technology and so on, in DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, we will start to see that transformation come to place in the next two to three years. When the personalization of platform technology finally comes into its total being, you will find that technology no longer sits with large businesses, but with the individual. Already, we can see that we have been unpowered, you and me, because of our mobile device. But because of the Internet of Things, because of blockchain, machine learning, artificial intelligence, we're going to have so much more power in our hands as individuals that used to not even exist when man sent the first astronauts to space or the large businesses like IBM used to run large banks and large companies. The evolution of blockchain technology is based on a very simple ideology. If you remember, in the HTTP era, the protocol layer was very thin. That was HTTP. It was invented by Tim Berners-Lee, whom I know quite well. And he didn't make money from that simple coding that he put together to be able to share files. The applications that were built on HTTP became huge businesses. We have Facebook and Baidu, and we've got, in China, we've got Sina, and we've got a whole range of large businesses, JD, and so on, that became created and today exist on the HTTP protocol. In blockchain, it's exactly the opposite. The protocol belongs to you. It's in your hand. And the application becomes a tiny little part of your everyday life. And the control of that relationship between you and the application is in your hand. It's in your power. The amazing thing about cryptocurrencies is not that the price of cryptocurrencies went up dramatically. The amazing thing about cryptocurrencies is that everyone can create a cryptocurrency. You can create a cryptocurrency. I can create a cryptocurrency. The evolution in blockchain technology continues at an amazing pace today. Some of the presentations that were made this morning were trying to move what used to exist in the platform technology into blockchain. If you describe blockchain as a token, and if I describe the token as a nut, uh, it's a token or a nut that can carry several huge dimensions in finance that used to exist in large businesses before. So today, token technology is a form of technology that can absorb uh, both the applications as well as the payments for those applications as well as the investment for the applications. When you look at many of the new cryptos that are being created, uh, such as uh, vodka dot and even si simple funny ones like uh, Do Dogecoin um, and application-centric ones like Tezos and XRP, they, they actually represent each of them a specific technology application that they're trying to solve 
And guess what? They are also being funded on the token. And finally, of course, tokens also represent a digital asset which you can save and you can make as part of your overall asset. China has gone through tremendous transformations in the last 40 to 50 years. In 1978, when Teng Xiaoping first opened China for business with the rest of the world, the per capita GDP was 156 US dollars. In 2001, when the China joined the WTO, the per capita GDP was $1,053. I think the achievements of China at the lowest level of human civilization, of human society building, of country building, is a very well told story. China lifted 800 million people out of poverty. In fact, my one amazement of China is the literacy that was created that today over 90% of people are literate, which did not used to be. And many other countries in the world still struggle with these numbers. Poverty, literacy, the basic amenities for its people. China is way past that now. It is now a proper middle-income country. Where China is today is a country that, of course, all of us know, the world's largest manufacturer the world's biggest service economy. The GDP today is 10,000 US dollars. China produces 9 million graduates a year. When I travel through the country and I see the huge railways and the highways and the amazing new glistering cities, I think about the engineering talent that is being released into the economy right now. China produces 600,000 engineers a year. The US produces 60,000 engineers a year. STEM graduates, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, China recent in the last few years, 4.7 million STEM graduates being released into the economy and makes it possible for the country to build all of the infrastructure and the economy that it has today. So this part of China's economy is a very well-known story. It's a story that all of us celebrate. The question then is that top 1% of China's story, not the 9 million graduates that China releases a year, the 1% of that 9 million, the 90,000, who needs to lead China into the next dimension, the next realm. In order to understand the challenges that China has for that top 1%, one of the huge difficulties of China's economy is in building the chip technology. Today, China has sent rockets to other planets to Mars. But this one technology is confusing everybody. Why is it that it's the one technology that China finds it difficult to overcome and to master? In this technology, the revolution that is taking place is immense. The key players in this technology are reducing the size of the microchip to be able to do 50 billion transistors in 10 nanometers of space. And the technology is predicated by upstream abilities, including the skill sets of the university students that come out into the marketplace, the downstream demands of the technology to be able to meet the physical needs of the software and the applications that need to be developed, and the competition in the industry. Currently, the IC market is 143 billion. China only makes 23 billion. The Made in China Policy 2025, the goal is to have 70% of microchips made in China. Currently, China produces 16%. The analysts say that, in all likelihood, China will probably do 19.4 to 
of the global demand for microchips by 2025. The problem is in the skills required and the imagination required to build electronic design automate, automation, the lithographic equipment, and so on, which China still struggles with. This is the phase of the microchip technology. And what can you tell about the phase of the microchip technology? The man on your left, Kunle Olokontun, is a Nigerian born in the UK. The man in the center, Rodrigo Liang, is American Chinese, who used to work for a company that Olokontun used to invest in or started, which was sold to Sun Microsystems many years ago. And the man on your extreme, on my extreme left, is Christopher Ree, uh, Kunle's colleague in Stanford University. These three men put together a microchip, which today is the hottest chip in the market. It's called Samba Nova, and it's, the chip is called Cardinal SN10. It's AI uh, centric, and it's meant to be, be a general purpose AI chip. The point of this particular slide is to tell you the challenge today comes from anywhere in the world. When we think about all the numbers that represent how big China is and how successful China is, we think about the 1.5 billion people who make China. When we think about how successful the US is and how big the US is, it actually benefits from 7 billion people around the world who want to go there in order to make their livelihood and their success in leading edge technologies like the microchip. The problem appears to be several fold. Firstly, the microchip industry is highly competitive. If you look at just the companies that are involved in the microchip, industry. In 2000, TSMC acquired WSMC for only $550 million. Today, NVIDIA is going to um, you know, acquire ARM Holdings for $40 billion. Each of these players have been in the industry for many years. The DNA that is required to succeed in this industry is um, immense and the people in the industry and the companies in this business have been uh, very good at what they do for many years. The technology itself has been changing dramatically. And then, of course, the fact that the user's demand has been increasing and will in continue to increase as we continue to put more technology into the hands of individuals. The top five players in the semiconductor industry uh, from around the world, they are all here in China, and yet that transition of the technology for China has not yet taken place. Perhaps another analogy might make better sense. When we think about an aircraft, like the Boeing 777, the Dreamliner, which is one of the more newer aircraft uh, put out by Boeing, Something that the U.S. has been able to do well that China will probably need to learn from and master is the fact that the latest aircraft are never made from one country. The Boeing, for example, is made from about uh, 12 countries, five continents, 100 partners. The battery is from Japan. The doors are from Sweden and from uh, from, from different countries like Canada and so on. The wing tip is from Korea. When the iPhone was being invented, uh, they, they needed to find a screen that was going to be used by the iPhone, and they found it in Japan. These are some of the people who are overachievers in the US. What do you think is the common feature of these overachievers? Look at all of them. I think you recognize a few of the names. Bill Gates, Paul Allen, Mark Zuckerberg, 
And then I put in a few of the movie industry overachievers like Steven Spielberg. Can you guess what is the common feature among all of them? They are all university dropouts. That's the 1% of the US. They drop out for many reasons. But the main reason is that they had nothing more to learn in university that they did not already know or that they weren't enough equipped to be able to get on with the things that they wanted to achieve. I tried to get a sense of where these people come from. What is interesting about the US is that uh, there are two very specific areas up north in the north, extreme northeast and the extreme northwest. And if you visit these places, you'll see that they're highly stable parts of the country. And there's one feature that is common to all three, all the people that I just um, put together for you, which is, firstly, they enjoy their leisure. Secondly, they are curious. And thirdly, they are knowledgeable. And that's exactly the kind of culture that you want to build in a new area like this northern Chiang area in Nanjing, which is an area that is open to people who enjoy their leisure, who are curious, and who are knowledgeable. And the big challenge for this area is how are we going to create this ecosystem for people who are overachievers? The US had already given up that middle layer of their development. They are now in that little top area of the best of the best and how they can continue to dominate the world's economy through technology. One of my favorite stories in China is the story of Chen He, whose name is called Ma He, his original name. The Yongle Emperor sent him on seven voyages out into the south part of China, into Southeast Asia, and then to the Indian Ocean, to West Asia, as they call it. And what interests me about Chen He is that he actually started his journey from this city, from Nanjing. And there's one feature about Nanjing which is very interesting. Together with Nanjing, four cities which made these journeys possible. And I did not understand it until I started visiting the different museums in this city. Chen He was Muslim. And in that time, in that period of 1100 to 1300, there was a huge Muslim population in these cities. And in that period, in the early days of a thousand years ago, the Muslims were known for one very important skill, which is they were very good astronomers. In fact, more than 2,000 stars were given, the names were given by the Arabic people. And the Arabic people were doing a lot of trade with uh, China and their door of entry was Nanjing. So when I think about the story of Chen He, I think about a city that was always open to foreigners, that got the best of foreigners and attracted them to come and live in this city and to be part of the story that eventually became the history of China. Society is going through a fundamental transformation and it always has from tribal to institutions, to markets, and then to a phenomenon called networks. So not only are we going to be all empowered individually, we are also going to be networked with each other at an individual level. In fact, some of the presentations made this morning attributed to that, which is not only are they creating blockchains, they're going to make blockchains more integrated with other blockchains. So as society evolves and these transformations take place, we need to think about Nanjing and this area being part of a networked world. So the purpose of my presentation is this. Nanjing, global city, we need to make it into a people-centric technology city.
a people-centric economy and a people-centric city. Since China started opening up, it has put in place many important special economic zones, free ports, free trade zones, and now the time has come to think about free people zones, for want of a better word. What do you do in a people's zone? Well, I thought about it and I was thinking about certain ideas and I leave you with these ideas. How about a Sun Yat-sen presidential scholarship to the best student in technology from anywhere in the world? How about international schools? You're already thinking about that. How about investor homes in this region with a residency visa attached to it? Medical center, collaboration with some of the world's best medical institutions. How about a Nanjing World Young Talent Competition? Because the future belongs to the young people. These are some thoughts that I want to leave you with. How to make Nanjing capture the imagination of the world. Thank you.